Right, and for our next speakers, I'd like to introduce uh, Drs. Jeff Druck and David Duong. Uh, Dr. Druck is coming from Denver Health Residency Program, University of Colorado, and Dr. Duong from uh, Highlands uh, Residency Program. Both are uh, very well respected educators, and both actually run two very successful uh, residency programs in terms of diversity and inclusion. And today, they'd like to share some of their insights with you. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. So, this is going to be kind of like that um, flight with that is leaving a little bit late, so we're going to catch up on some time to get you to where we're going to end up on time. Okay, everyone? Um, no conflicts of interest. If you'd like to give us money, we'd be happy to take yeah, it. If you want to we'll put your name up there. We'll, yeah, we'll get you tomorrow. So we're going to talk, um, our goals today are to talk about residency recruitment and then strategic planning around residency recruitment to make your program more successful. And we also, once you have your residency, wanna, what can we do to support them? What can we do to support their success while they're in residency? So this is... This is data from Dawan and his group, actually it's unpublished, uh, but it talks about why we should have a strategy, why we need strategic planning in having a diverse residency program. Um, and it's, it's more that this study found that if you have a deliberate program, not a specific program, nothing in particular, but just a deliberate program, you're more likely to have a more diverse residency program. So bottom line is plan ahead, you want to plan for not only just for a year, but maybe even longer than that. And here's an example of what we do at Highland Hospital. We're gonna go over some of the points for here. The one I wanna point out that I thought was a bit more challenging than I initially thought was defining diversity. So this is something where it's a charged issue. People have a lot of opinions, but it was well worth the time for our residency and our residents to talk and define what they um, thought res uh, diversity is. So, um, actually, do you mind going back one yeah. slide? Just a quick question. Do you all know what it was that defined whether or not your program had a lot of diversity before people started instituting programs? What was the number one factor? Does anybody know? And where were the programs? Diverse faculty. And what was diverse faculty based on? It was diverse rest of the institution and people around that area that were diverse also, right? Um, and so there were a lot of programs that said, oh my gosh, we're doing terribly from this perspective and we need to change something. And so they instituted a bunch of different things. So about, I guess it's now seven years ago, we instituted uh, one of the first visiting elective scholarship programs. And uh, subsequently other places started doing that. And what you'll actually see is, is that actually it's now become almost the standard that residency programs have visiting scholarship programs. Because it's like, hey, we want to recruit diverse applicants and this is one way to do it and if you if you go back to that that original slide of the sort of things that different people do second look days mentorship programs all those different things a lot of places have started doing that and so now the next question that we're going to talk about at some point of time in the future is what is it that you can do that now sets you apart because beforehand that was one of the things that you could do to set yourself apart so do you mind going to the next slide so Along those lines, what do URM students actually care about? What do we need to focus on from a diversity recruitment perspective? And this is a study that was done um, by Dowen and uh, Mike Jasandi and Cheryl Heron and uh, myself at a bunch of different institutions. And we tried to find out what it was that underrepresented minority students preferred to find out about as opposed to other students. And you can see there are certain things that everybody wants to know about. Everybody wants to know about interaction with residents and what your inter interview day experience is and where the location is. But the things that made a difference were things like seeing patients of a similar ethnic background. Makes sense, right? They wanted to see a diversity statement on the website. And they wanted to see an emphasis on diversity. And the reason for that is that people want to know that they're going to be cared for. And so along those lines, these similar things, diversity of the residents, diversity of the faculty, the availability of community outreach programs, programs of forming, uh, affirming commitment to diversity, mentorship programs for the residents are all things that underrepresented minority students preferentially want to see, as opposed to just every resident wants to see. So along with the sub-internships, the scholarships that are popping up, a lot of these are popping up in departments too, diversity committees. So we just want to touch on this just a little bit because it really should be more than just underrepresented in medicine faculty and residents. Um, it's a diversity committee, so it should be diverse, have all kinds of people in there, including, um, I'm going to give some example, our department chair. So we in invited our department chair to be part of it, you know, and even if it just can be in spirit, 
this was really helpful. We lost funding for a diversity scholarship and we had to figure this out. And it was his suggestion to use, we have a, another um, uh, fund that he was able to use so that we can immediately use that. In other words, um, a fundraise from our alumni to raise money for this diversity scholarship. Our, your chair can also um, ask faculty to participate in any cultural competency offerings there too. So this diversity committee can be pretty effective also if you give it specific goals, tangible goals like defining diversity. Um, one thing that happened after our match day this year, we just said, uh, oh, the residents are like, we need more LGBTQ residents. We don't, we didn't really match any that. So let's work on it this year. And so now we're forming a strategy for this coming year for that. And that's uh, one of the things that your diversity committee can do. How many here have the opportunity to be involved in the application process before interviews are sent out? Awesome. Because I think this is a really important part of the process is making sure there's not implicit bias before we send out the, uh, the applications for, I mean, the interviews, as opposed to after they've already been offered an interview and now we get a chance to get in there. So these are some of the things that, that um, we can do to decrease bias in the application review. One thing I did want to point out, uh, a strategy that we use, and I think um, Denver uses this as well too, is how can you align your department's mission with the application process? So at Highland it is, we want to serve our diverse population, patient population. Okay, so in the application, what specifically do the applicants do that help our demographics? as opposed to just extracurriculars, but what specifically do they do? And I think this also can help in play too. You can give them, in other words, it's weighted more than other parts of the application because it aligns with your goals and your department. This is the, the talk about holistic review. Has every, is everyone familiar with that? Okay, good. And I may, we may be talking to the crowd, but how many people do not know what the IAT is? Or how many people have taken the IAT? Implicit, so, Mr. so I was just kind of breezed through this a little bit too, but this is something that people in who are reviewing your applications, um, we encourage them to, to take this, to help de-bias um, when they're going through uh, selecting residents. And I guess just to clarify, I, I don't think it's necessarily to de-bias, but it's to recognize that you have the bias mm -hmm. so that you can incorporate that into your assessment of uh, applications. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, it's one prong of, of de-biasing, but not just at the beginning step. There was an interesting study that came out of a university, the Ohio State University, that everyone in the admissions committee took the IAT. It did seem to lead to a trend towards a more diverse class, but more importantly, the people in the admissions committee uh, found it very helpful in understanding what their biases were. So um, some people may come from places that don't have a lot of diversity within their own program, and the question is, is where else can you possibly go? And hopefully you can go to your school and, you know, that your school may represent a more diverse setting than, than just your department. So, for example, if your department doesn't have any diversity, then saying, hey, is there diversity within the school? And using the school as a resource. So, for example, a lot of places have second look days that are school-wide. And so that way when you have underrepresented minority students come back, they can see that they won't be the only one. They may be the only one in emergency medicine, but they won't be the only one within the entire school. Uh, along the similar lines, do you mind flipping? Yeah, is that you can also get community involvement. And so the idea here is is not so much that you're saying, boy, the community is going to support the person, but that anyone that comes to your program is going to see, hey, there are people that are successful, there are people that can act as mentors for me. And so this is a, an image of the National Association of uh, the Health Service exec Executives. They're actually the ones that run the first, uh, the first evening of our second look program for our school. And, um, you know, we have it at, uh, at a library, um, that has some cultural significance in Denver, and they're the ones that put on the programming to make sure that, that our hopeful future residents that come in will say, boy, I'm not going to be the only one within this environment, and there's going to be community support for me. Okay, so the, we're moving on to the second part of our talk, and so let's say that you, are, you have an underrepresented in medicine resident, hopefully two, what are some things that, or even more than that, what are some things that we can do to promote their success? We're gonna be talking about these topics. Importantly, it's a very important part of it. We're not gonna be talking about the institutional interventions for inclusion, though very critical. We're gonna be talking about what we can do as individuals and as programs and departments. The first one, 
We touched upon this with Alden's talk, and actually in SM's talk had some demographics on this as well too. But this is something I think we need to understand, not just us, but also all our faculty uh, that, and everyone that's involved in the training of our residents, that our underrepresented minority residents experience loneliness and isolation. They feel like they are singled out. They stand out. Um, they might feel that they are under the microscope, you know, whether it's uh, the in-training exam or evaluations. Uh, we talked a little bit about some of the microaggressions Cheryl calls it thousand cuts, um, uh, death by, death, death by thousand <laughs> cuts. Really but then there was overt racism when we talk about the bigoted patients, um, and this is stuff that our residents have to, our underrepresented residents go through, almost every day. This is added stress that other residents don't have to face, and I think we need to acknowledge that not only in our mentorship, um, but also in our in, in our interactions with our faculty as well too. So what does this do? Well. Our underrepresented medicine residents, they might interpret this a little bit differently. So they might feel that they don't belong. If they have this aggression towards them, I'm not in medicine, this is not for me, this is not my tribe, then they can also start feeling that, um, that when there is a setback, when there is a quote unquote failure, that it's something innate about them, as opposed to just a process of part of their development. And I think we need to take that into account too to help support our underrepresented medicine residents. So what do we do to support them? What do we need to do to create this environment where they feel safe? This is something that I think is very interesting that um, we've been thinking about applying more and more, but it's the lay theory of transition. Um, um, imagine this resident. It's, it's, it's the resident who just, you can't get it in this resident's head, no matter what kind of criticism or constructive feedback, they don't seem to, they don't seem to get it. They don't seem to kind of change. Um, and that's partly because of their interpretation of the kind of feedback they're getting. So the lay theory is a more positive spin. It's, you know, it's, it's positive spin that it's using it for the forces of good because we have underrepresented medicine residents who actually take the opposite view that if they do fail, it's probably their fault. It's, or if they, or it's something where they carry the weight of their race on their shoulders. If they fail, if they're not a good um, black physician, then people will think all black physicians are not good. So what this does is it takes the thought, the idea that, hey, all of us have adversity. All of us have challenges. And we, get, we surmount them. We get through them. We can get through them. And it means nothing about me as a person. It means nothing about me and my ability to succeed. There was this study that came out of Stanford and uh, University of Austin. And it was for first year, um, first year students, for university students. And what it looked at, what it intervened and gave them this theory um, help them with a positive mindset, uh, had peers tell about their stories of how they got through um, adversity successfully, gave them some modules, and they found that first year, their retention rate in the first year was higher than those who did not receive lay theory training. Also, they had higher GPAs, and they were more likely to reach out for academic, um, academic tools for their success. So what does this mean for residency training? For, first of all, I talked about mentorship, so this is something that we should incorporate in our mentorship, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. But what about something like remediation? So something that we do is we kind of reframed remediation. Let's put ourselves in the shoes of a resident, and you've given them uh, academic probation. They will feel ashamed. They will feel alone. They will be less likely to reach out for help for success, um, to help them achieve. But what if we rephrase it and it's not a status? You're not on academic probation because it's a status, but it's a process. Hey, we all go through this. We all have struggles and we can get through it together. Let me pair you up. Let me make sure that you're talking to your mentor. Let's pair you up with a, with a senior. Let's do different things to get through this together, but as a process as opposed to, hey, you're not a great resident. The next thing is we're gonna be talking about is mentoring across differences. So how many people here have the opportunity to mentor someone different than themselves. Awesome, right? It's, it's pretty amazing. Um, and so we were gonna talk a little bit more about just the difference between mentorship in general and mentorship with underrepresented medicine residents. The first is the idea of a tribe of mentors. So not just having one, maybe our role is not just to mentor one, but to help our underrepresented medicine residents have a tribe of mentors, a board of directors, if you will. It keeps them accountable for their goals. So one of the things that I 
did, I, I have um, more than one mentor, but I also have a peer mentor, and I think this can be really important. An example I'd like to give is, um, it's more, more like a true north group, but you know, ha we've all been in this, uh, in, in an, op uh, what is it? In a situation where we have to pick between different opportunities. We're doing research projects, we're doing different, trying to do different leadership positions. We're offered opportunities that we think we're gonna grow to love there. Well, this group keeps you accountable for, accountable and helps you say yes or no to these opportunities so that you can keep on track to what you want to do. I'm just curious, how many of you that are involved in residency education have a one-on-one -on -one required mentor for, for every resident? How many of you have a required mentors for one resident? So I think that that says it to some extent. You know, if you expect that there's going to be one person that's right for that one resident, then you're not going to accomplish your goal and that there really does need to be a, a team approach. And this is something that I think we should be promoting to other faculty on here. So I have one gay mentor and, you know, that's, that's awesome. I don't, all my mentors are not gay, you know, like me. That'd be very interesting if they, if they all were. Um, but I think that there's room for all of us to mentor di people who are different than us because we don't expect everyone that's a mentor to be the same as us and not everyone that's like us are necessarily good mentors. So the next part of this is talking, not, you know, we, we, I've talked to different, we've talked to different people and we can go through the literature and makes a good mentor as well. Um, some of the things that kind of popped up in the literature is that being enthusiastic, I think is a number one, is a number number one, one thing. factor is to be a good mentor is being enthusiastic. And time, yeah. considering a lot of, uh, making sure that you're consistent, you're offering a lot of your time. But then when it comes to the underrepresented medicine resident, it's also, yes, listening, listening, listening. I think that's a huge part of it, like for any mentorship relationship. But in gaining their trust, part of it is hearing their story. It really is about listening hearing where they come from, getting to know who they are as a professional and as a person first. Also in terms of gaining their trust is exposing your vulnerabilities appropriately. And then from there, you can kind of go on and ask about their dreams and aspirations and also help them anticipate some of the roadblocks that they have and help them address that through that relationship. Another thing to instill in mentorship, in your mentors for those who are mentoring across differences is that it's okay to be wrong. When there's cultural insensitivity to apologize, but then ask them, hey, help me learn. How can I learn from this? What can I do better as a mentor? Um, and then um, there was one other thing, sorry, I'm blanking on it for right now. Oh, um, I'm gonna, sorry, I'm thinking about the time, so I'm gonna move on from there, <laughs> sorry. That you can learn, that you can learn to be a mentor, that you don't necessarily are born a mentor, but there's different trainings. At Highland and at UCSF, there are different kinds, of there, there are workshops where you can learn to mentor. And then if you don't have that, you can hire someone to come to your shop. And finally, there is a, there's national organizations like the Academy of Communicating Health Healthcare, which specifically offers courses on mentoring across differences. So, um, I did want to talk just briefly uh, about what our goal is and um, and how I think that we have actually failed. So this is the uh, the percent of um, the different races within uh, the Metro Denver area, and then the percent in emergency medicine. And um, the reason that I put this up here is is you know one of our goals is to make sure that our patient population is accurately reflected within our provider mix. Um, but one of the problems that we have and has been elaborated on over and over again is, is that we don't have enough underrepresented applicants in emergency medicine. And so every year what ends up happening is, is you know, we recruit our folks and I'm like, oh, I really like this guy, I really like this guy. And then I look and we don't get them and they end up at Highland or they end up at USC. And those are the two places that always steal our residents, you bastards. Anyway. Um, <laughs> But the point is, is that there's a fixed pool and there's only so many people that you can pull from. So if I'm, steal if I'm stealing, if I'm recruiting someone, then that means that they aren't going to be going someplace else. And so along those lines, the real problem that we have is, is that we don't have enough people within this group. And so our options are we can either look short term and try and 
recruit more people that would have otherwise been going into things like internal medicine or surgery or something else, and we can try and pull from those other specialties, but all we're doing then is, is just stealing from other specialties. And what we really need to do is we really, really need to increase this percent in EM by increasing the percent in medicine, which is why I wanted to sort of end with the appeal that people also make sure that you work on pipeline programs, um, because that is really how we're going to solve this problem as a society. Um, the one other thing that I did want to point out, as a, as a straight white male, you know, I always get questions, why the heck are you up talking about this? And the answer is, is how can I not talk about this? Um, the fact of the matter is, is that this is a societal problem. This is not a one group's problem. This is an our problem, and we really need to solve it together. With that, I think we've caught almost all the way up. I know. Boy, we rocked it. <laughs> Any quick questions that we can answer for you to get back on track? Doug. It's a limited pool. We're all fighting for the same limited pool. Are we setting our goals of success incorrectly? If the goal is to say we, ought, we all just want more under, underrepresented individuals in our program, we're all going to fail, or most of us are going to fail in a few places succeed. So do we need to change the goal? Do we need to, do we need to broaden our definition of what are we, what are we trying to accomplish? Because if we're trying to go for a statistic, the vast majority of us are going to continue to fail. And you think you have a hard time in Denver, try it in St. Louis. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could change the statistics. You could change it to fractionalization. So that's another way to talk about diversity as well, too. It still, talks, it still goes back to the numbers um, of it. And I think Jeff is right. We, we can we can try to enhance diversity within emergency medicine. I think we should, and I think we can. Um, but at the same time, it's about, it's about the pool coming into medical school in the first place. And we could spin the statistics however we want. And I think many of us strive for the diversity component, but don't really focus on the, on the inclusion component as well. And I was that resident that felt ex that was like the only minority in my program for a long time, and I felt the emotions that you described, and I think given your residents a platform um, to bring about change, which was one of the ways that I, I found my voice there, or connecting them to people in the, in the community or other programs um, as, as a way to help them feel included. Awesome. Yeah, I, I was gonna say something really radical here, right? <laughs> so, yeah, I know, oh. <laughs> 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 So, so I've been listening, you know, intently to this, and, and what sort of I, I'm noticing, I bristle when I hear this is a problem, right? We keep saying diversity is a problem. Is it a problem, or is it something we just need to do? So words matter, and when we say, and people say, well, why do you want to go into emergency medicine? So this is just, it sucks. Okay, so, but I think we should consider, just consider for a second, reframing that it's not a problem. It is something we just need to do, because what problem suggests is, well, I don't have to deal with that, right? It's another thing I have to think about. It's another thing I gotta get involved with. Here's another problem I gotta focus on. So I would just suggest that, you know, when we are talking with our students to the pipeline and, you know, and they're looking at burnout and they're looking at all these things and we are trying to convince people to consider the excitement and the engagement about doing things, such as EM or an URM in EM, I would just challenge us to really look at it in a very, to your point, positive, yes, and we know, we know it's a problem, but we also know it's, it's, it's a possibility to do what's right and for us to change the narrative to make it great. Oh, God. I sounded like somebody that I would want no, to No, but that like. goes to the point, I think, Alden, you had that in your presentation about how... <laughs> For sure, I think that's, that's a great point. I, I believe it was in your presentation, Alden, that it's something that businesses look towards to enhance. This is not a problem. This is how can we, we can make ourselves better. We can make our, we can make our um, institution, our business, our whatever it is, better when we have diversity. So let's try to get that because it'll make us a better I a say, opportunity. Thought process about making the 
Just one, one comment. Um, always hard to fo follow Cheryl after she makes her comment, so mine doesn't really count. Uh, Doug, to your point, I, I think we do need to look at other measures for success. Uh, you can't give up, though. You can't say, well, we'll not look at um, uh, diversity numbers, because it's still how we're measured. Um, Jeff, I'm going to take one issue with something that you just said. When you said that you've failed, I disagree completely. So um, this is what was presented, David and, and Jeff, what was presented was great effort. It's an approach that we need to take. So you can't say, well, there's not a supply, let's just stop doing this. So I actually think it's not only is it not a failure, but I think this is a great success. And we just come up with some measure that shows that it's successful, but this is actually what needs to be done. There needs to be great attention paid to this. There's got to be great effort, because if we don't, then it will never happen. At least we've got a chance. Then you factor in all the obstacles. Well, you know, we're emergency physicians. We find ways around those obstacles. So I, I'll just say, it, it actually, it's great success. This is a model for how we should all do things. And if we were all able to uh, put this kind of effort in, well, we might actually uh, be able to move the needle.